The board game hobby has a history of being known as, well, kind of boring. At least to those who don't partake. If I had a dollar for every time a friend acted as though they'd rather do anything else on the planet than learn a new board game, then walked away from the table at the end saying it was one of the most fun they've ever had, I'd have some non-zero amount of money. I don't know. Regardless, trading in the Mediterranean is a colloquial term sometimes thrown around within the community to exemplify this apparent dry boredom. And there's an insanely large number of people out there who don't know that not every game that comes out these days is about buying hotels or wondering why someone chose to use a candlestick as a weapon. The other options just make so much more sense. Welcome to Board Game Rundown. I'm Dan, and today we're going to run down 10 great board games with unique and interesting themes. At number 10, let's talk about The Bloody Inn. The Bloody Inn at its heart is a card game about trying to run a successful inn. Each round of the game, you're going to be choosing between multiple interesting options, including whether or not you should build an annex and whether you should bury the body. Oh yeah, did I forget to mention that the main thing you're going to be doing in this game is killing your guests and hiding their bodies from the police? The Bloody Inn is a riot, where players are bribing people, laundering money, and trying to hide their victims from the police with the main goal of having the most money at the end of the game. Its ridiculousness is its genius, and its excellent art feeds right into the mood. I mean, just look at these people. The Bloody Inn supports up to four players and does have a solo variant, but in my opinion, the more the merrier when it comes to this macabre game seemingly based on the Red Inn affair in 19th century France. Pearl Games and Nicholas Robert knocked it out of the park with this one, and we think you should check it out. Number nine is going to be Euphoria Build a Better Dystopia. Euphoria supports two to six players, and well, this one just makes me laugh. Euphoria from Stonemaier Games might seem like a basic worker placement game using dice at first glance, where players are placing their dice in order to gain resources and then moving up tracks to win. And well, yeah, kinda, I guess, but where this game really gets me is what the dice represent. Yeah, they're your workers, and that would make you think their pips represent, like, how much wood they can gather something. Nope, not in Euphoria. Here the pips represent your workers' knowledge or how aware they are that they are in a dystopia. You are constantly trying to lower your workers' knowledge so they don't wise up and leave, and there's even a slot on the board you can send your dice that lowers it using electroshock therapy. It's just incredible. Yeah, the game's fun, but it's the theme that makes me keep wanting to come back to this one. Number eight is Time Stories, and this is where I feel the need to explain that while this list is based on themes, sometimes how well the mechanisms of the game bring that theme to the table plays a pretty large part in how interesting it is to play. Time Stories theme is cool, there's no question there. Basically think cooperative quantum leap. Players are jumping back in time into other people's bodies to solve a mystery. While you probably won't figure out everything on your first jump, your memory's not erased either. Did you learn that the key to the drawer is in the closet last jump? Well, then you can just immediately go to the closet and get a head start this time. It's a game about finding the most efficient path to victory through trial and error, and then solving the entire mystery in one jump before time runs out and you're all thrown back to the future. Anyone who knows me knows that I am obsessed with time travel, especially when it's done well. And here, Space Cowboys did it well. Just a couple things to add here at the end. First of all, the game has a fantastic insert that allows you to save the game in the middle of a scenario and pick it back up later where you left off. This is a fantastic and a little thematic that they added this. Secondly, Time Stories is a game that runs on scenarios and are sold separately. So after solving the one that comes with the base game, you will have to buy more and they too tend to be a little hit and miss. So maybe do a tiny bit of spoiler for research when adding a few to your collection. If anything I just said sounds interesting, I beg of you, check out Time Stories before you miss your chance and this guy tells you how disappointed he is for wasting taxpayer dollars. Screw you, Bob. You go in there and you try to do the thing with the, it's not even my body. I'm stuck in some lunatic and then the one guy doesn't even make any sense. How am I supposed to? Number seven is a war of whispers. Have you ever wanted to be worm tongue from Lord of the Rings? No? Oh, I, I really thought that was a selling point here. Um, well, the fascinating thing about War of Whispers is that it's an area control game where you don't actually control any of the factions fighting over the areas. Each faction instead plays as a secret society with their own hidden motives, whispering into the ears of the warring factions, trying to get them to think they know what's best and manipulate the board state. I might build up one faction's defenses this turn just to tear them down to the next in an epic backstab. 
Each player has a set of randomized loyalty tokens at the beginning of the game, so let's say I really want the Lion faction to have a bunch of control at the end, and about halfway through I'm noticing that maybe nobody else does. That's okay, I can reveal where the Lion token was and switch it with another token I reveal. Sure, I'm giving my opponents a lot of info on who I'm rooting for, but if they've been working towards hurting the Lions, are they really gonna turn their whole game around just to spite me? Maybe. And those mind games are at the heart of this beast. The theme is dripping with secrets and betrayals, and it all comes across beautifully in this two to four player masterpiece from Starling Games. Number six goes to Turing Machine. I heard you like math, so I got you math for your math. That could be the mediocre tagline for this incredible game from Scorpion Mask, where players compete to deduce a secret code by asking a stand-in for an analog computer questions. I'm not gonna lie, I've rewritten this part of this video three times now because this game is so freaking hard to explain without just doing a how to play. Picture yourself as Alan Turing trying desperately to break the Enigma code. You're almost there, okay? Now that you're all hyped up, the basic idea is that there is a three-digit code that you need to solve. You're going to try to solve it by making your own three-digit number and testing it against certain rules the correct number follows. You're testing your number by basically creating an old analog computer layering multiple cards together. Ta-da! <laughs> the replayability here is basically endless, especially since you can go to the game's website and get more code combinations. I get it, this game isn't going to be for everybody. But if you're like me and you enjoy a good Sudoku every now and then, get over here and play this game with me. This is deduction in its purest form, deduction incarnate. The quality components here are top notch for what it is, and the art and component makeup is so on theme, it's crazy. You're literally creating an old analog computer sheet to feed your numbers through. A plus, Scorpion Mask, A plus. Number five, Hegemony, lead your class to victory. So you thought the last game had a niche audience, huh? What have I done? In Hegemony, up to four players take on the roles of either the working class, the middle class, the capitalists, or the state, all vying for the power to reach true hegemonic status. If you're the working or middle class, you need jobs in order to buy goods and be happy. The capitalist can supply these jobs for you, but also sets the wages. Don't like it? Well, the working class can strike, and the middle class can just supply their own jobs. But the capitalists need workers for their own production of goods to sell in and out of country, so they may be willing to negotiate those back up. Meanwhile, the state is trying to keep a perfect balance of happiness so that no one class gathers too much control. Guys, this game is insane. It's, it's a board game. And the theming here is incredible. From what I understand, the designers actually worked with economic specialists to get this game as real as possible while still being fun. And you can feel it. You can genuinely learn things about how certain elements of society work, in an abstracted way of course, while enjoying some of the best gaming I've ever experienced. Hegemonic Games Project also spared no expense when it comes to their production value. The game is beautiful, while still capturing that we're here to work mentality. Hegemony was the first game I ever backed on Kickstarter blindly, and I haven't regretted it for a second. If you want to pass laws, get rich, and show society how it's done, maybe check out Hegemony, lead your class to victory. Number four is Millennium Blades, and we've reached the one game on this list I've only played once and had to do a little bit of research on in order to talk about. I just remembered its theme being crazy, and it kind of is, in a meta way. Millennium Blades is about buying CCG card packs and boosters, opening them, building decks with them, and then playing them in tournaments to win fame and fortune. Remember, this is a board game, not an actual CCG. So all of this is abstracted in various interesting ways. There are cards that represent entire booster packs, and the meta is changing with cards becoming more or less relevant, so you need to pay attention and maybe sell that Clogatron you've been holding on to. Cards have elements, types, rarities, effects and abilities, and more. All things that are going to matter and change the gamescape as you try to become the very best like no one ever was. Yeah, that makes more sense for Pokemon than Magic, but you get the point. If you like CCGs, if you like board games, this is the mesh for you. Try Millennium Blades. Number 
Number three goes to the wonderful abomination, The Heir of Frankenstein. This beautiful worker placement game from Plant Hat Studios puts two to four players in the shoes of scientists being tasked by a mysterious benefactor to try to recreate Dr. Frankenstein's original experiment and bring to life another abomination. Players will be gathering parts and building a body on their player board and then shocking that body with electricity. Where do the body parts come from? Has anyone ever told you that you ask too many questions? As a player, you choose. Sure, you can dig up a body, but it's so old and stale now. The morgue will have more fresh bodies, but something's still missing. You could always just go kill someone. Can't get much more fresh than that. Of course, you could avoid human parts altogether and just use animal parts. More humane? Maybe, but I'm not sure how effective it will be. This game is dark, but that's what you want if you're buying a game about Dr. Frankenstein's monster, right? The winner is whoever successfully recreated the good doctor's experiment, or whoever has the most points if no one has. Let's get one thing clear, guys. If we ever play this game, and when you succeed in creating your abomination, you don't scream, it's alive, it's alive! We can't be friends. Number two. U-Boot the board game, or rather, U-Boat the submarine simulator where you should probably spend a couple weeks researching how to actually crew an actual submarine in order to play. And I'm only kinda kidding here. My first time playing this game, I was about to be the navigator, and I literally spent a week learning how to navigate a sub because it's pretty darn realistic. I was using a ruler and protractor on a map while having to pay attention to our speed and depth, all to plot our course and approximate our arrival time. It's probably my second favorite moment in my entire gaming history. You Boot the Board Game from Phalanx is a one to four player cooperative real-time game where players take on the roles of captain, first officer, navigator, and chief engineer, all with their own asymmetric duties they need to perform from repairs and preparing dinner to managing morale and handling the app. Yes, this is an app-driven game, but guys, I swear this one's awesome. The main thing the app is gonna be used for is the periscope. Yeah, you heard me right. When the captain uses the periscope, they literally hold up their phone to their eyes and view a virtual reality version of what the sub sees where you are on the map. This means that if you're in combat, the captain has to watch through the periscope and give instructions to the chief engineer on where to fire. You have to line up your firing arc, flood the tanks, and sink their battleship. This is what I love about doing in this hobby. Get together with friends and play a six hour game that leaves you feeling truly accomplished and like you learned something and I'll never forget my first time playing U-Boat. Number one is Nyctophobia. Okay, early on when I talked about Millennium Blades uh, being the game I had to look up, well, okay, I kinda had to for this one too. We at Board Game Rundown have been talking about this game for years and we still haven't had the chance to play it. This one earns its spot at number one off its story as well as its theme. Nyctophobia is a 4v1 game where one player hunts the other four in a labyrinthine maze while the four try to accomplish a set objective. Simple enough, right? Oh yeah, the four players being hunted are blindfolded. Their only hope of getting through the maze is by communicating with each other as they explore by having the hunter player move and guide their hands where they wish to go. The players have to build the maze in their head together and make it through while completing their objective. That's the basic gameplay and it sounds incredible. Now for an overview of the story which surrounds its designer, Catherine. See, Catherine loved playing board games with her uncle, who is blind. This obviously brings certain issues to games where rules have to be altered in order to play. So Catherine set out to design a game that would put her uncle and all other players on even footing. In Nyctophobia, your eyes are useless. Instead, you use your hands and your voice to communicate everything you need to to your team. Plus, it's just so creepy that you have to rely on the player trying to kill you to move your hand for you. I, ah, I love it. And that's our list. Go ahead and comment any games you think we might have missed, and if we get enough, maybe we'll make a part two to this video. I want to thank everyone for watching. I hope you saw something today that you want to look further into after this. Special shout out to our patrons on Patreon. I literally can't thank you guys enough for your support, especially while we're still getting this thing all set up. Don't forget to like the video if you liked it and subscribe to see more guys. I've been Dan and I'll see you next time.